It's good to see everyone with us today. We have some who have joined us uh, via online. It's good to have you watching our study. And we don't, as I mentioned a while ago, we will be going into Nehemiah. I don't have the workbooks 100% completed yet, so we'll wait. And once I have those done, we'll make those available. I doubt we'll get through the first chapter today, but we might. If we do, we'll just back up and do the questions later <laughs> once we have chapter two. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer this morning. And Dan, would you mind directing us in that prayer, please? Our Father in heaven, we come before thee with thankful hearts, realizing that without thee we would have nothing. We would not even be. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the church, the plan of salvation. We thank thee for thy son who came to this earth and lived a perfect life and then died so that we, through obedience to you and him, we could have a home with thee in heaven. We ask thee, Heavenly Father, to be merciful unto us and as we repent of the things that we do that are in error, we, we pray for thy forgiveness. We would ask thee, Heavenly Father, at this time to be with those of our number who are uh, sick and cannot uh, function as they normally would with good health and we'd ask you to uh, heal them and, and so that they can once again uh, work for thee in the way that they want to. We ask thee Heavenly Father to be with us now as we open up uh, thy word from the Old Testament as uh, you have told us that it's our schoolmaster and as we try to learn the things that we need to know to glorify thee and serve thee better. We pray that you'll be with us and help us in this endeavor and help us to use the things that we learn to uh, be better Christians. We are thinking of these things this morning, Heavenly Father, and we come before thee uh, through thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We do have some who aren't able to be with us due to uh, illness. Vaccine is still at home recovering. And I talked with uh, Valicia this morning. Her father's situation, what made it so difficult, is he was in the hospital originally to have a, a, his carotid artery cleaned out. But a couple years back, he developed a situation um, after they did a scope where his intestines, not intestines, his esophagus got twisted up really bad. And they've been needing to do the surgery on that, but this, the carotid artery, carotid artery took precedence. And well, after he went home from this surgery, he started having se severe problems brought about by the twisted esophagus. Well, um, after the second one, they said he's staying in the hospital until they do the surgery, until they get this surgery straightened out. And um, so he'll, with, she doesn't know when they're going to do it, hopefully sooner than later. But on top of that, he was complaining about his hip a little bit. They did an x-ray, and his hip is now rubbing bone on bone. So they're going to have to schedule that in. So if you would keep her and their, their family and their prayers as they go through this. So, All right, let's do the questions for Ezra chapter 10, and then we will step into Nehemiah chapter 1. Once, as I said a while ago, once I get the workbook for Nehemiah completed, um, we'll distribute them, and I'll put them on our website as well. Who gathered around Ezra while he was praying and bowing down before the house of God? Very large assembly of men and women. Children of children. Israel, men and women. Exactly, yeah, men, women, and children, a large assembly. Number two, what covenant did the people of Israel make with God after confessing their sin of taking pagan wives? They would put them away. Exactly. And that all they the children would, from the union. That's right, they would put them away. All right, let's look at number three there. When Ezra and the leaders called all the descendants of the captivity together at Jerusalem, what would happen to those who did not come within three days? That's right. The property would be confiscated and he would be separated. That's exactly right. Separated from the assembly there. On the ninth day, no, on the day of the ninth, what? Let me reread that. On what day of the ninth month did the people gather together? 20th day. 20th day, verse 9. At this gathering, why were the people trembling? I think they were uh, feeling the guilt of their sins plus the heavy rains. Yes, exactly right. Because of this matter, it says, and the heavy rain. That's right. And then question number six. What did the people agree to do regarding their pagan wives and children? That's right. That's right. And that's what's so special about this particular one. It simply wasn't a separation from the pagan wives but from the people of the land as well. 
from the people of the land, which they should have done in the beginning, but they neglected to do that when they returned. I just put C question two on C question two. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> All right. All right, let me let's go over to Nehemiah 1. Now let's do a little background information here on uh, Nehemiah. When we begin this story here, Nehemiah is in Sushan or Susa. If you look at, I've got a, um, this is, let me see. Again, I've, I've reverted back to these older maps, and um, they look great in the study Bible I have, but when they put them in digital form, they're just not quite as sharp. But if you'll notice here, and let me switch it for the people there at home, if you'll notice in this case of point, over here where, near where it says Babylonia, you'll see the city called Susa, right in this area there. And let me bring this up a little bit larger. And Susa there is more than likely right in the region of what would have been the capital of Babylonia or the region of Persia there. And more than likely, and this is more than likely the same Shushan that it says Nehemiah was from. Now, who else in our biblical history was from, or took, what story took place in the area of Shushan? Esther. Story of Esther. Exactly. The story of Esther took place in the same area there. So we begin with Nehemiah there. Time-wise, I'm going to say, based on, depending on what source you look at, it is approximately 12 to 14 years after Ezra goes. All right, so we're still, we're still Nehemiah is a contemporary of Ezra, but it's approximately 12 to 14 years later, sometime around 444 B.C., or, yeah, B.C., when Nehemiah travels over here to Jerusalem. John, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by when Ezra is gone? Oh, when, oh when, when I, what I meant to say was when Ezra made his first journey. Oh, okay. That was about 452 or 454, no, 458 A.D. And um, we're looking at now about 444 okay. B.C., not A.D., B.C. So about 12 to 14 years later there. Uh, any thoughts so far? Now, we, we, don't know, we don't know exactly who wrote Nehemiah. Someone says, yeah, but it says, I, Nehemiah. You know, this is the story. More than likely, and if you go back and you look at, if you had a copy of the original Hebrew text, Ezra and Nehemiah was one book. The original Hebrew text, it was one book. So the Hebrew scholars who had collected the books down through the centuries had kept them together. Probably Ezra actually penned both books. And one, one source I looked at suggested that he quoted from Nehemiah's writings. So Nehemiah had written an account of everything that had happened, but it's very likely that Ezra compiled it together, and that's why the Hebrews viewed it as one book um, in the years that developed after that. But, for, but in the, uh, the Greek and for us today, it's divided up in two different books there. Um, also, in relation to this, what would you say would be the, what, what was the difference between Ezra and Nehemiah regarding occupation? Well, what, what occupation was Ezra? Let's start there first. What's that? Yeah, Ezra was a scribe. He was a scribe. He was a learner of the law. He, had, uh, he went with the express purpose of teaching the people. Nehemiah, on the other hand, what, did, what type of service did he do for the king? Yeah, he was a cupbearer for the king. One source I looked at suggested that his responsibility probably was more than of a butler. Might, might have, he might have even counseled the king. He, he, he was with the king so much that when the king saw him and he was upset, the king inquired, why are you upset? And then the, it is the king and his wife, after Ezra tells him what's wrong, and the king said, well, what would you like to do? Nehemiah, thank you. And Nehemiah said, this is what I would like to do. It was the king and his wife that said, well, how long will you be gone? And interesting to note, according to what I read, that this particular king, Artaxerxes the first, I believe is who we're looking at here, Artaxerxes the first would have been the stepson of which great Persian queen? Esther. Esther, exactly. Probably would have been the stepson because she was married to Xerxes 
And then Artaxerxes I would have been his son, so she would have been the stepmother. So this one source I was looking at goes on to suggest that it very well may have been possible that Ezra might have had a part in influencing Artaxerxes to support Nehemiah in what he was about to do. Not certain about it, but it's very, very possible. If she was still alive and on the scene at that time, she might have been an influence there. Yes, yeah. Gene. The scriptures also point out that not only was Ezra a scribe, it says he was a skilled scribe, skilled yes. in the law. Which the, seems that he would be in a position to give the right kind of advice to Nehemiah to get to the king. That's a very good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. Because uh, scribes generally just copy words. Right. Uh, and, you know, that would be the true definition of a scribe. But a skilled scribe would know the law. Right. And you kind of see the development of the scribe during the 70-year period of captivity. This Babylonian captivity was a very uh, crucial uh, point in the, um, well, I, want, I don't want to say fully a change, but there was a change in the people from before they went in to after they came out. Before they, get, they went in, they were Israelites, and they were called Israelites. They were descendants of Abraham. But while they were in the Babylonian captivity, they became known as what? Jews. Jews. That was the term that began to be applied to them. And when they came out of it, this is what we see. They're, they're now called Jews. And although they would have had men who, who would have recorded the law and made copies leading up to the captivity, when we look at Josiah, remember the temple was in disarray and the book of the law had been lost. So during the, the 70 year period of time and after their return, we see a development of what would be called scribes, whose individuals, was, it was their charge to copy the books, to make multiple copies of them. And they were so detailed that they would count the letters to make certain for uh, looking for accuracy. They would count over. It's a very interesting thing that they did there. And so we see this development up here and Ezra being one of the, I would suggest, maybe earlier ones. The one who actually was a scribe and not simply one who copied, but one who knew the law and taught the law. Now, in contrast, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He worked for the king. But yet he held the king's, uh, or I should say, he had the king's respect. And the king um, favored him. And so when he sent Nehemiah, when Nehemiah is going back to Jerusalem, why, why does he go back? Is it to bring about a spiritual reform or what? To rebuild the walls and the gates. Yeah, it's more of a physical reform. Now he will do, he will, he will do his part in again bringing the people back to God, you know, correcting some problems that had developed. But he essentially went back for a physical reformation to get the walls rebuilt to get Jerusalem re-secured. Because Ezra didn't do any of that. Ezra's responsibility, and those during the 57 years prior to that, was all about getting Israel spiritually back right with God and the worship back in place. All right, any thoughts or comments? Ms. Pat. Uh, I always wondered when they, were began, when they began to be called Jews. Does the word Jew mean their religion? Is that why they started calling them Jews? I think they yeah. from Jew, Jews are what Gene said. Jude is a form of Judah. Okay. I yeah. wondered, where did that word come from? Yeah. I've been asked the question. I can really answer it. Yeah, as a matter so, of fact, Jerusalem has... Uh, it seems like it would might have the same uh, word origin to it, too. Mm -hmm. They were from Jerusalem. If we look over in um, Esther chapter 2, verse 5. What are you doing there? Oh. We'll look over there in Esther 2, verse 5, and we'll call up the, the, uh, the Hebrew uh, dictionary here for this one. We find here that this particular word, Jew, is from, is U-D, and um, it is from thir uh, 3063, which is... Judah, okay, Hebrew word for Judah. And basically it's Judahite, that is Judahite or Jew, descendant of Judah, that is, you know, spelled out like that, but it's actually Judah. So it's real simple. It basically is what they were calling the people who were descended from Judah. They were Jews. If you look at chapter 1, verse 2 of Nehemiah, you kind of get the same idea. 
Yes, yes, yes. Um, and basically, this is how they identified them. And you know, from this point on, from this point on, this is what they were known as. You think about that. Even, even down today, they're still referred to as the Jews. And he says here, one of my brethren came with me from Judah, and I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped. Those from Jerusalem, yeah. yeah the Hebrew word is uh, hudai. Yeah. Or Judahite. Or Judahite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, any thoughts? Gene? Just, just, a, just an interesting question that interested me, probably not anybody else. <laughs> but you talk about approximately 70 years of captivity. Mm -hmm. 70, multiples of seven, 70 years during the early days of the church, is and it seems to be a very important number. <laughs> 70 or multiples of seven. That's right. It is very interesting. It's always been a, a complete number. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th this is kind of the path, though, that Harold Camping had took in, in, in his false prediction. God had told Noah that it would be seven days before he would bring the flood. And he went to a days with the Lord, you know, days, a thousand years. So he said 7,000 years. And so he was able, supposedly, to identify when the flood began and figured 7,000 years from that point and missed it two or three times. But that's different, though, than what you're talking about. It, it is an interesting, um, I, whether we call it coincidence or what have you, that 70 years there in captivity, and the, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. And um, about 100 A.D., roughly 70 years after church began, we really see flourishing of apostasy developing within the leadership of the church. Yeah, interesting. All right, any other thoughts? All right, let's go ahead and do some reading now. And we'll, we'll have some of this information in the, um, the outline in the lesson booklet once I have that uh, completed for you there. Let's start in verse 1 of the book of Nehemiah. And as, as this particular part of the story opens here, we find Nehemiah receiving some very disturbing news regarding Jerusalem. And so, Dale, if you would read for us there in Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's read uh, verses 1 and 2, please. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Helkaliah, Hel it came to pass in the month of Chisholm in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Okay. And Miss uh, Ms. Wilma, would you mind reading for us verses 3 and 4? And I apologize, there are a lot of big words in this reading. <laughs> <laughs> and they said to me, The survivors who are left in the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Okay, let's stop there for a moment now and look at this. So we have, and we mentioned a while ago, he begins by saying the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Um, these, the, this is his account. Whether he wrote it and gave it to Ezra and Ezra included it, or he wrote it and Ezra quoted it. Either way, this is his account of things that took place. Now, in preparation for the questions, I came across you will find another Nehemiah listed in this book, and it's not Nehemiah, the author of the book. It's quite interesting when you come across that, so you'll see that in the questions. Now, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, and the month of Chislev would have been which, approximately what time of the year? And he put notes on that. November, December month, but not so. Yeah, about the ninth month. And uh, the first month would have started sometime around our March or April. And then, if I remember correctly, and then that would put it, like you said, around sometime November, September, November, um, or October, November, in that time period. So, Chislev is the ninth month, and he says, in the 20th year, the 20th year, 20th year of what? Probably the reign of Artaxerxes. Yeah, probably during the reign of Artaxerxes. And that's what, and when, if when you go back to Ezra, Artaxerxes had not been on the throne very long when Ezra made his journey over there. So that's why I said earlier, approximately 12 to, 15, 12 to 14 years 
gap in that time frame there. So then we find there in verse 2, oh, I made the point, he was in Shushan the citadel, he was there with the king, serving as cupbearer, we'll read later. So you have a fellow by the name of Hanani, his brethren, came from Judah. And, a, and I asked him, he asked them about the Jews. He wanted to know about the people that had survived the captivity and how things were going. Now it's interesting because again, we are at roughly 57 plus 14 years. So we're at nearly 70 years. Well, it would have been 70 years from the time they went into captivity. Um, but we're looking at a, a you know, nice little span of time from the original group, not 70 years from the time they went into captivity, we're looking at nearly 70 years from when the first group returned. So he wants to know, how are things going? You know, how did Ezra do? How, you know, how's how? And in his case, the point being that he works for the king, he's probably more politically minded. How's the city making out? You know, have, have they rebuilt the walls? What have they done there? You can kind of imagine maybe those questions. And in reply to his inquiry there in verse 3, they look at the picture they paint. They said the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now do you think that he's, when he says that the walls are broken down, he's talking about from the original attack that Nebuchadnezzar had led and that the walls had never been rebuilt? And that the gates had never been reestablished. Is, is that more than likely what he's referring to? Could he be, could it? Very possible. It's very possible. I'm it's, getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it doesn't, then, then there's an implication here that Ezra and the people rebuilt the walls, and then some the Sanballat and the others came in and tore them down. You know. So if if it's not the original destruction, then, then that one. Yeah, that they would have had to have rebuilt and we'd have no record of it, which is possible. If, if it was That's the original destruction, that would not really have been any news to the MI. Right. Uh, the, yeah, that's a very good point. He would have known that um, because of the way this reads, the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, kind of suggesting that maybe in the report that now it's broken down, not that it still remains un, unrepaired or still... Is it still broken disrepair? But Rhonda? Then he could have been just shocked by the fact that the brethren, his, his brethren had not taken the time to rebuild this. You know, it was no different. You know, look, they didn't build the temple. You know, that's they, true. They were living in their townhouses. You know, even though things were tough on them, they were living it up in their own nice houses and God's house lay in room. And so it's nothing for them to become <coughs> lazy. And, well, and not do the things that they need to do because over in Second Kings is when um, the Chaldeans come in and they do. They, yeah. It's one of the things that they point out. They did break down the walls of Jerusalem, and that was one of their ways of taking it over. That's true. They burned the gates. And they burned the yeah. gates. And, because and, think about the mindset of the people, and I, I think that's a very good point that, that you bring up there. Think about the mindset of the people. Here they, they, they have made their long journey, the first group of people, back over to this region. And what's the very first thing they do after they built the altar, or rebuilt the altar? They all went back, they all went back to their original homes. And, well, and, yeah, then they came and they rebuilt and they, they repaired the foundation. And they got into some challenges with that, so they go back to their homes. And over the next 16 years, here they are in the most important area they neglect for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So finally, under the prophesy of, of Haggai and Zechariah, they come and they get it rebuilt. But remember, their lives are still going on. And who's left here in Jerusalem? Well, the Levites and the priests and whoever chose to return and live back in Jerusalem. And so it's possible that over this 57-year period of time that they neglected the rebuilding of it. It's very possible. Because they had so many other things that they had to tend to to get their lives. And then they had their wives in. They got this whole pagan wives event. They got to figure out alimony and how to take care of all that. Just don't know about that. But the point is, though, it's very possible that they, he's referring to the original destruction. And they were just, once again, neglected. From a spiritual standpoint, they finally dealt with what needed to be done. That was most important. But they should have already rebuilt the walls by this point. And... Uh, Nehemiah sees this as being a major issue. It's 
kind of hard to hang a gate when you have no walls. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's exactly you know, right. And that would be an, an easy thing to do is put up a gate to keep wild animals out or uh, thieves or whatever you, whatever they used the, yeah. the walls to protect them from. And if you leave the walls down, you have nothing to hang a gate on. So that's right. You know, One right. of the things I found in, in studying for this is that while, while we will have in chapter 3 and following, we'll have a list of the gates that are rebuilt, it's not possible to identify every area that they did rebuild. Um, one thing they do know, and I'll go ahead and bring this up while I'm thinking about it, is um, the, the walls that Nehemiah built. Yeah, this is not. Well, let's see. Let me zoom this in and see if this will be a little more visible. It's just not as good as what it needs to be. But anyway, what scholars speculate is that the walls that Nehemiah built were not the same coverage as the original walls. They didn't cover the same area of Jerusalem. They would have covered a much, you know, just probably the temple and just the right surrounding area, more than likely. It took them 53, 52 days to build it. So we're not looking at a very large, yeah. And nor was the quality very good either. It would have been just fastly and hurriedly done. It's bad. Why would they do that? Is it just because uh, lack of zeal or lack of, of stuff to work with or lack of people to do the work? Why would they shrink it? There wasn't as many of them. Well, they had sores to fight. They had their sores. Yeah, they had their sores on one hand. Yeah, you have to think about that. They, they had a lot, of, a lot of pressure, but they knew the Lord would be with them. And probably in their mindset was, let's get up what we have to get up now so we are protected. So that our, our city is now, the, you know, something that is defended. Yeah. Um, and so when you look, when, when, when you kind of look at some of your maps, may, some of your Bibles may have a little, little outline. And I've got a better one. I thought that would work. I guess this is what they're saying is where the, the new... The new, um, the new walls? Yeah, that where the new walls of Nehemiah would have been built. Whereas Jerusalem itself before would have encompassed the larger area. Uh, during the time of Hezekiah. Maybe even the orchards there. and Possibly so, yeah. And, um, but in any case, though, it was more than likely, at least if you look at all maps and all drawings, they suggest a much smaller coverage there. Which, again, makes a measure of sense because they, they've got to get the wall up so they're protected. Now, I, I'm, still, I still, I'm still left wondering, why weren't they concerned about this all along? If, if it's the original destruction that they're having to go through and rebuild the walls up now. And the only answer I would have is that they were too busy with their own lives to do it. If they did rebuild the walls early on and we have no record of it, then they would have been torn down and the gate burned down again. And so it's, that, that would be the, the secondary possibility. Um, is it okay if I read something from Psalms about from David about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. where he, it's in Psalms 51 when he starts out, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the right sacrifices in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. In a sense saying, you know, this, this, these walls were important to God too. It wasn't something that, you know, they mm -hmm. should have neglected. That this should yeah. have been important to the people, knowing that this was part of what God desired. You know that, That's a very good that point. all of these things. It wasn't just the temple. It wasn't just. It's everything that God says. Every jot, every tittle is important to God. Yeah. And so we need to do everything his, He commands. His city was important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I looked at six commentaries while we've been doing all this talking. Mm -hmm. Adam Clark is the only one that says that these were not the original wall. All okay. of the commentary suggests that they were the original walls. When these people came back with Ezra and everything, their priority was to build the temple. Right. That was the first thing that they had to do. In all probabilities, uh, due to the fact that they had to uh, put away these pagan wives and put away their pagan life and all that, the, the temple was their priority. They got that built, but then they, they began to procrastinate a little bit. They never got around to finishing what they were supposed to do, which was the the wall of Jerusalem. Right. And so this is what they're saying now. The walls are still broken down. Their job's not done yet. Right. That's a good point. Very good point. Yes, Gene. Yeah. People today are not, people don't know different than every day. Procrastination mm -hmm. is always a problem. Right. 
There's always something out. I could suggest one, one circumstance where the Jews came back and they saw the walls down and the gates burned, but they saw their fields needing work. They said, well, that's been down so long, mm -hmm. a little bit longer won't hurt. And we'll go ahead and take care of our personal needs before we do that. That's right. And one day leads to a next, to a next, to a year. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> I think, I think you're right. Ms. Pat. I just wanted to say that it makes us understand why the blood of Christ was so <laughs> important. That's all we got yeah. is the blood of Christ to save any of us. I'll tell you what, what's interesting about all this. Um, when, and, and this kind of goes back to the um, article, I think, that I wrote Sunday. The Lord in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the Lord had said, um, I'm leaving Jerusalem and I'm going to head to the east. And then in um, Isaiah chapter 40, beginning, going from verses 1 to 11, he, used, he, he describes the return, prepare the way for him to return. And it's interesting because those same words are used in reference to John the baptizer. You know, prepare the way. And what is interesting about that is that when Ezekiel said the Lord would leave Jerusalem and remove his glory from Jerusalem and that he's returning, more than likely it is referencing the people itself, not so much the actual city, but the Lord had left them. That's why, you know, 70-year captivity, they were gone, now he's returning them. Here's my point. What Rhonda brought up a while ago from the passage in Psalms is quite interesting. If Jerusalem and Zion kind of was symbolic of the people, then the city itself would never have been completed until the walls were established. Well, think about the, the Jews. How many times did they go through a portion of their service unto God, but not all the whole? You know, and so it, it, it's a good lesson for us today that while we as Christians today focus on certain things spiritually related, we have to look at the whole of the person, the whole of who we are, the work of the church, and not, and not get so worried about one thing that we forget about everything. You, know, you can kind of work with that, kind of see an underlying lesson there with that. All right, any thoughts or comments? All right, let's continue with this. Uh, look at verse 4. Verse 4. When Nehemiah heard this, he says that when, he, when I heard these words, Nehemiah sat down and he wept for how long? Many days. Many days, exactly. And not only that, he says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He wasn't simply in despair, but he was praying to God. He was praying and fasting, praying to God. To him, this struck him as terrible news. He might, it might have been years since they've gotten a good report. And so he was probably expecting things to be a lot better. For everything to have completed. The people went back, they took the city back, and now everything's fine. But that wasn't the message that he received. All right, any thoughts? All right, let's continue reading here. And let's see, Miss Rita. Would you mind beginning there in verse 5 and read for us verses 5 and 6, please? And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servants, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Okay, Ms. Edna May, would you mind reading for us there verses 7 and 8, please? We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statute, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. All right, and Mr. Gene, if you would read for us, um, start with verse 9, just take us to the end of the chapter, please. But if you return to me and keep my commandments, do them through some of you, though some of you were cast out of the farthest part of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have spoken, which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed from your great power and by your strong hand. 
O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name, and let your servants prosper this day, I pray. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Okay. All right, let's go back up now to verse 5. I went ahead and wanted to look at all of this because this is Nehemiah's prayer to the Heavenly Father. Very significant prayer and one filled with examples. For, for just a moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to know that uh, Nehemiah, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, uh, Nehemiah was not there. He was far away from him. Right. This. The people that were there were not mournful in the way that Nehemiah was. That's a very good point. And in the church today, we sometimes get complacent in the same way. We don't have that strong feeling we need to have like Nehemiah had here. In fact, when you look at some of the commentaries, uh, and if you went to Nehemiah, the second chapter, verse 1, mm -hmm. this is the first time that Nehemiah was sad before the king. Right. It suggested that he mourned for approximately four months upon hearing this news. Oh, wow. You would definitely see the demeanor, the change in the countenance of the man. That's a good point. And I, I think that's something that I hadn't really thought about. That it's, it's, it is significant that he was distraught. But it's even more significant that the people more than likely were not who lived in the land. Because they had grown accustomed to it. Why, they, if they had been this distraught, they would have been working on it. It would have already been dealt with and taken care of. Um, and I think it's a good analogy making reference to us in the church today. Sometimes we take sin, at, we're kind of complacent about whether or not we're upset about it. And we just, we accept it and go on. Any other thoughts? Kind of remind you of Ezra. Except Ezra pulled his beard and, and he was really about the situation, so this is kind of similar. It, it is. That's a very good point. Um, the, the difference between the two, Ezra got there and saw it, well, it was reported to him. And he was there in the land. And that right there impacted the spiritual well-being of the, of the assembly of people. Whereas this was impacting the safety, physical safety of the people. Both, both extremely important. And it's tragic that it had not been tended to yet. Any thoughts? All right, let's look beginning in there in verse 5. All right, notice here he begins by saying, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. It's interesting because as Nehemiah, he is throughout this not so much reminding the Lord but he is acknowledging the truth about the Lord within his prayer. For instance, we see there in verse 5 there, he recognizes how great and awesome of a God he is. He keeps his very covenant, and his mercy is with those who what? Exactly. And this right here is still true today. The mercy of the Lord is with those who love him and with those who observe his commandments. The Lord has not changed in that respect. The commands have changed. The ordinances have changed. But the requirement of the Lord, the expectation of his people to love him and to keep his commandments. Well, Solomon says that's the whole duty of man, to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Yes, Dan. I think uh, there's a major difference in uh, uh, when the Lord dealt with his people directly mm -hmm. than in today's time our uh, our reward and our blessings that we receive are not only in Christ and and for today, but they are also for the future. Uh, as he dealt with uh, the children of Israel, he dealt with them directly. When they disobeyed him and left him, then uh, then the nations around them absorbed them. Right. And they were punished by these nations around them. And uh, today, I think it rains on the just and the unjust is what I'm trying to say. We don't necessarily 
because of our Christianity and our service to God, always uh, benefit from it in a physical manner. Right. Uh, there are times when thing, bad things happen to Christians, is, is what I'm saying. It rains on the just and the unjust. All the laws of what I'm going to call nature, or mm -hmm. what God intended for it to be, were set in... Uh, uh, set into motion uh, such as tornadoes and and lightning strikes and all of this stuff all of those uh, laws that provide us with rain and weather and changing seasons and all that stuff was set into motion by God and sometimes uh, one of those uh, phenomenons of that of that weather mm -hmm. impact Christians in an adverse way but we shouldn't think that that's God uh, punishing us for something that we've done or have not done, that's because our house was built where the tornado was coming. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, don't blame God because he's providing weather changes and, and thanks for us to, uh, you know, th this is all set into motion so we can survive on this planet. Yeah. And God put it there. Uh, but during this time, he dealt with Israel directly you know, uh, I mean, in a miraculous way, he dealt with these people sometimes and, and, and had nations around them uh, take them captive and punish them for, uh, for their turning away from them. That's right. There was no question right. this was done because of this or this was done because of that. But I think today we as Christians can, can look forward to our reward not necessarily being in this life. Okay. I'm just saying, sometimes bad things are going to happen to us, even if we are good Christians. So don't let that shake your faith. Don't let that turn, your, uh, turn you away from God, because our reward that we're supposed to be looking for is not this little vapor of a life that we have here. It's for eternity later okay. on. All right. Uh, Gene, did you have your hand up? Yeah, the, uh, I don't think there's any, any questions of what... Nehemiah was not reminding God of what he promised. The, the sin of Israel was spoken of earlier in mm -hmm. Ezra, which I think was going back to the reason for their captivity in the first place. Sure. And uh, I think what Nehemiah is doing is, in, in a way, expressing the condemnation by God of the Jews mm -hmm. for not being attentive to what he wants done and right. obeying his commandments. Rather than reminding God, he's, he's condemning the Jews. Mm -hmm. That's right. For sinning. That's a very good point. This, let's not forget, as we, read the, as we read this earlier, this is essentially a confession mm -hmm. to God, a, you know, acknowledgement mm -hmm. to God of the sin of the Jews. And he also and said he sinned. In this, yeah, he includes himself as sinning. So did Ezra. Yeah. You know, it was, you think about that. Although Ezra wasn't guilty, being a part of the whole, you bore the guilt of the whole. Same is, thing here. Is Nehemiah saying here, I should have done more? I should have acted earlier? I don't think so. What's he, what's he saying? You know, um, I, 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 think, I think he's, he's a part of the people. And so if the people's guilty, he's guilty as a whole. Well, he's know. lamenting yeah. uh, the fact that the Jews are not serving the Lord as they should. Exactly. You know, yeah. Uh, Pat. But how much encouragement do these people get? Like we have, a, we have the opportunity. That the, the church is set up to, to admonish and <laughs> all this for us. We mm -hmm. have that. Right. What did they have to spur them on? God's not going to speak to each and every one of them. Well, they, they would have had uh, the the daily uh, duties of the priests, the yearly duties of the priests. That they were to participate in every time. Really? Yeah, and okay. and there were, especially when it comes to sacrifices. Now, um, it wasn't required for all the people every day to go to Jerusalem, of course. All right, yes. but they would, there would have had, if you recall, that while the Levites did not have land, they were giving, they were given cities in every tribe. You know, many times we think of the Levites being centered locally there in Jerusalem. But there would have been Levites throughout the land. And so they would have been tending to what, however their responsibility panned out to teach the people and instruct the people. You know, that's what they would have been doing. So they were falling down on the job. 
<laughs> they had more to do than lay up in their paneled houses. I know exactly that. right. <laughs> not exactly doing it because the people. I wanted to. Now I need to go back and look at this, and I can't remember exactly. It's, if, if you know this, let me know. The practice of having the um, synagogue. I thought I had read it kind of developed during this time time period. But I'm not positive. It could have developed during the 400 silent year period. Um, and, and that is to say synagogues were able to be built by Jewish law if there were so many Jews within a given area. And then they could build you know, synagogues in that area. And it's very, and I'm not positive. I need to go back and look at this. We may be too early for those yet. But I really think that the local priests would have done their part in helping to teach the people and strengthen the people. Just a reading of the law daily would have helped them. Well, and, but you know, not everybody would have a copy of the law. I know. You know but the priest but teaching the priest, it to them. Yeah. So the, there was a lot of people letting, uh, falling down on their jobs. That's right. That's right. Gene? Yeah, and in Jesus, so Jesus' parable, he condemned the Jews. He said, you had the prophets. That's right. Did you hear them? Mm -hmm. So they had the priests, they had the prophets, they had the leaders. Right. They were supposed to lead, but in many cases did not. And he, no, they, had, they had ample evidence, <laughs> which seems to me, to know the law, to know the prophets. That's right. And the prophets appeared periodically when the Jews got into trouble. Prophets were, it were, uh, uh, were uh, prophets rose up and gave a specific message to the Jews. That's right. And you're going to have Ezra. This is part of his responsibility. Um, Zechariah was going to prophesy. And Haggai, both around you know, the same ball part-time period. And in Malachi, he's going to prophesy as well. So th there would have been, if they were willing to listen, individuals who would have done the, the like encouragement of what you're talking about. Any other thoughts? Dale, Dale, did you have something? Okay. Um, well, I've searched that because I'm curious about now the origin of the synagogues, you know, what time period, and I've forgotten. And yes, Dan. Now, this was after uh, God allowed kings, right? As far as the uh, the, uh, the people wanting kings. Yes, this is well after this. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah will end up serving as a governor. Because these people do have a king. Their king is Artaxerxes. <laughs> you know, they're under his kingship. And he's going to allow Nehemiah, I think, twice to serve as kind of a governor over the land there. Okay. It yeah. just, it, it's just apparent to me that if they had followed God's plan for them, mm -hmm. uh, they would have had an easier time of it. You know, they demanded kings like the nations around them. Right. And, uh, and some of these kings were bad. That's right. I mean, the majority of them were bad. That's right. So, if they had followed God's plan, having the uh, uh, the family fathers and everybody in charge and and the prophets and mm -hmm. and all of that, they would have. I think they would have had a lot easier time of this than than going off on their own way here. That's right. One one side note. Why do you think? Just a kind of a suggestion here. Why do you think the people had not been really concerned with rebuilding the walls? And um, this should have occurred to me earlier, just now hit me. Why they probably weren't concerned with rebuilding the walls and the gate. They thought they had protection from Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes. Yeah, they, they, were, they were all under one rule now. Mm -hmm. you know, and so his, his men will, will protect us. We have his authority and his decree to protect us. That's probably why they, they probably took that for granted. You know, and they didn't see a need because although you had the Ammonites and others, they would have they would have risked the wrath of the king in an all out attack on Jerusalem to have taken the city. All they did was thwarted their efforts to build. Shouldn't we as Christians today build a wall? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We we don't live out in the world. We're not of the world. We are separate. We're separate from them. We better have a walls or else they're gonna overtake us. Yeah. Overtake our heart and Right. Don't let the kids hear you give an answer that fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, though. Thinking yeah. about that, she is it. We, we, <laughs> need, we need walls to protect what we have on the inside. From the standpoint, we're not going to let us naturally our salvation. We're not going to let yeah. it still our so, still away our relationship. Our with spiritual God. wall. And we also have to keep out the influence of the world and keep out mm -hmm. anything that we try to uh, keep out Satan, who who's wanting to devour us. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, thank you. 
Yeah, that's. I appreciate it. I do. Yeah. So I don't think that's difficult. Okay. If you read the scriptures, <laughs> if you pray to God to help you, if you have a good husband like I have, <laughs> who reminds me when I'm not doing what I should, and other Christians. Yeah that I can see who are working and who are doing what God wants them to do. That's right. Uh, our, exactly right, Doris. Right. Our individual families uh, mirror our Christian family. Yeah. And, and we're to help each other as a Christian family and as a, a, family, a family unit. That's right. But in the end, the wall that we put up, though, is our own desire and want to. Israel, the people of Judah, they should have rebuilt the wall. They should have rebuilt it 50 years. As soon as they got the temple done, they should have built the walls right. up. But they didn't see the need to it. And if we desire to have that wall up so that we can be ready to stand, as, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, then we'll do it. And it'll be establishment through the word through our desire to serve the Lord and through living according to His Word. What happens is we get too complacent. That's all right. Trust in our own riches, our own, uh, our own in individual uh, success, uh, affluence, instead of trusting in God. That's right. That's and, exactly and, right. And we don't... I don't think those people do. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they went to their paneled houses and said, uh, you know, we don't need God's protection. We don't have to do God's Word. Uh, we, can, we can survive without Him. That's exactly right. That was their, their attitude. And so, kind of coming, coming back to this here, and then I like the point that you had made earlier about easily being able to tell how God interacted. And for us today, it, it, it is, it, we have to realize it's all spiritual. But there are physical blessings. Oh, exactly. Yeah. But there could be a whole other discussion on that. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's, that's one of the problems I've often had, you know, you about, about sports players, you know, who, who say they're Christians, and they gather their team together, and they're going to pray to God for victory. What if the other team's doing the same thing, you know? <laughs> and so if they win, they give God the glory because they won. That means the other team needs to say, God, why did you let them win? That's it's why, your fault. It's I exactly mean, the same thing. It's why gambling's wrong. You know, it, it, the Bible does not say, thou shalt not gamble. Right. You know, thou shalt not play the horses. But what it does say is that all you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord with His authority. So if we're doing it with His authority, we can pray for His help in it. So, dear God, please take His money away from Him and give it to me. That's a gambler's prayer. Yeah. You know, that... That's what a gambler wants. Is that other guy's money? Exactly. But take this to heart, though. Every time something good happens to you, I don't know. a so blessing in life, you should always thank the Lord. Cauliflower. And any time something bad happens to you in life, you don't blame the Lord. You just pray to Him for help. You know, that's to me that that's the only way to handle it. Because beyond that, all blessings that are promised to flow are spiritual blessings. And we'll have the physical things that we need. Yes. You know, he'll take care of us. Well, as, Dan, as Dan said earlier, the bad things happen to good people. That's right. And the rain rains on the on just and the end of us. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, All right. Look at God's yes, son. There was none better than him. And so he mm. gave his son that right. guy. So that's right. Good things will happen. So that's good. And that's what we, good things that happen, but bad things happen. Well, well, Paul makes point, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm -hmm. The all things there, I believe, are spiritual pursuits and service mm -hmm. unto God. Um, you can endure your life, whatever it comes, but that's part of the spiritual blessings from God is the strength to endure. Yes, Pat? I just have to add to what Sister Edna said. Something bad happened to Christ that something good would come from it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, that might happen to us, too. It may. You know, Be we prepared. are refined uh, our, uh, We are refined by fire, mm -hmm. even in this life. That's right. You know, we're put... Uh, Through trials. <laughs> you know, right. we are put in heat in this life, and if we come out 
uh, we know that we're purer than we were before the fire touched us. So if if we if we pass through these trials and these uh, these bad things that happen to us and come out uh, still serving God, then we're better than we were before. That's right. That's right. And the bad thing is Heading not buying an iPad today and three months later they come out with a new one. That's not a bad thing. So let's make sure we keep our priorities straight. <laughs> All right. Yes, Gene. There, and we need to keep in mind, too, there are these kinds of things happening to Christians yeah. in some parts of the world right today. Right. Exactly. That's a very good point. The, um, we forget about it here. I don't know if you, some of you will remember a couple of years ago, you know, I asked for your prayers for a young Egyptian who they were trying to teach named Tati, um, or at least that was the name he chose. He actually has a, a Muslim name. Well, he been, ended up obeying the gospel, and now he's uh, attending Florida College now. You know, so it's really, really great. Uh, but in, in some of the, in, and I, I just, you know, there were several people who played large in his conversion. Um, I just talked with him a few times, and, you know, not, not very much compared to what everybody else has done, but one thing that I did try to do for him is I looked up and found a church in Cairo and got in contact with the Egyptian preacher. Now, it was institutional as far as what started and everything, and the American preacher had already left. But it was an interesting dilemma because he wanted to be in contact with this fellow. I didn't tell him who he was. He wanted to be in contact with him, but I had to be careful how much information I gave to Tody because... He Somebody thought else. he could have been an undercover for the government. And this young Egyptian boy was fearful of me giving his information to mm -hmm. the stranger in Cairo, thinking that it could have been someone undercover. And so to my knowledge, they never got in contact, but brethren continued studying with him. And he obeyed the gospel, and uh, brethren went there baptized and everything. So the point is, he, he feared for his life. You know, had his parents known of his conversion to the truth, they very well could have, although not government sanctioned per se, but he could have been killed. Well, you know, and just look in the news, the recent yeah. news. Yeah. Uh, 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 four, girls. four girls, a uh, wife and three girls, was it, or something like that, or somebody? You know, they were killed uh, through the purification of the Islamic law. They they were being too much like. Us in the United States, they want, they wanted, they were being westernized, so they had an accident. Their car went off into wow. the river and yeah. killed them all. And, yes. and they've got the, the, mm -hmm. yeah, they've got the dad arrested exactly. for it. Yeah, I bet I, they're in a better way than we are right I now. Well, so, I, but I don't know I if know. they have obeyed the gospel, but they were at least trying to be. Uh, less yeah. they were turning their back on less Islam. Well, we, we need to keep in mind, and, and I have now taken this over. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we, we we do need to keep in mind that that yeah that, that while while we uh, complain about the things that our government's doing, you know, and I read a Facebook post and I understand that their point. You know, some schools you can't take your Bible, some schools you, you can't lead a public prayer, and things such as that. We still need to be thankful for what we do have and are able to do. And I think Paul's prayer means a lot of what he told Timothy. Pray for our leaders of the land that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. You know, and essentially I understand that to be make, pray that we can continue serving God. You know, and, that's, and in the end, that's, the, that's more important than anything else is our life as Christians and serving Him. Yes, Pat. Someone, someone in the beginning mentioned about praying for people who are not Christians. Well, specifically for their health. Okay. What was the question? Specifically oh. for their health and, and, and not focusing it on the spiritual needs of the person. Yeah, that's, that, make sure that's understood. Good specifically answer. for the health. Yeah, yeah. All right, any thoughts or comments? Let's plan next, no, two weeks. We'll be gone next Tuesday. In two weeks, we'll resume uh, in, in, right still at the start portion of the prayer here with Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6. We'll look at that uh, in two weeks and start from there. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, I just Dan. wanted to put out a disclaimer. The only reason I spoke up so much was to help you uh, in your endeavors to get our book ready before we got into <laughs> chapter two. Because I thought because Judy wasn't here, I'm bullying him. <laughs> that was part of it. 
Well, I appreciate your help in that, Dan. That gives me more time to get that completed. <laughs> I remember the Scripture Way broadcast tonight at 7.30 p.m. at scriptureway.org. It's good to have everyone watching online. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to questions at seminalpointcfc.org. If you would, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. And Dale, would you mind doing that, please? Our most loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we had this opportunity to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ to share a common love for Thee. We're thankful for Your Word, and we ask that as we continue to study the book of Nehemiah, that we might have a full understanding of those things that we can glean from it so that we can be better Christians and live a better life in service to Thee. Help us to look for opportunities to teach and encourage others that they might know the joys of being a Christian before it's everlasting too late. And we ask, Father, that you'd be with those of our numbers who are physically ill, that they might be restored to their health. As we go throughout this day, we ask that you'd be with us, that we would walk and talk in such a manner that others might see Christ in us through our words and our actions. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.